So good afternoon and welcome to the SJ Hall Lecture on Industrial Forestry. Uh, I'm Keith Gillis, Dean of the College of Natural Resources and a Professor of Forest Economics. Um, before I ask Susanna Loxon and Craig to come up to the podium to enlighten us about the innovative ways in which British Columbia and the forestry sector's revenue neutral carbon pricing system is impacting uh, climate change. Uh, I'd like to share some background about the S.J. Hall Lecture Series and its namesake, uh, Sherwood J. Hall. And I've, I've just learned that there were too many Sherwoods and it became a bit like the Monty Python episode where they asked the guy to assume the same name as everyone else in the department so to avoid confusion, right? Um, lots of Sherwoods. Um, upon acquiring his B.S. in forestry from New York State University, Syracuse in 1920, uh, Sherwood J. Hall entered the forestry profession as a consultant in the South for the James D. Lacey Company and in 1931 formed Forest Managers, Inc., uh, where he managed forestry, forests and advised clients. One of his clients was J.C. Penney, uh, whom he aided in sculpting uh, barren land into a forested home for a retirement center. Um, Hall played a major role in the development of the industrial forestry sector in the South uh, before moving to the Pacific Northwest in 1948. Um, and he was really one of the first people in the industry to recognize the potential of West Coast young growth timber stands. Uh, Hall and two partners acquired a 27,000 acre cutover redwood tract uh, and used it to establish the Gualala Redwoods Company. That company very quickly emerged as a leader in industrial management of young growth redwood land, demonstrating sustained yield forestry and conservation. Uh, Upon Hall's death in 1968, uh, Mrs. Desi Hall, who I, I, uh, who's move, moved to create the Forest Economics Foundation to advance the understanding and practice of, of sound economic principles among forestry students, uh, and later that year established the S.J. Hall Lectureship in Industrial Forestry and the S.J. Hall Chair in Forest Economics here at Berkeley. I had the privilege of holding the S.J. Hall uh, chair uh, for a period during my career here at Berkeley. Uh, Professor Peter Burke, who I did notice, oh, there we go. Uh, one of my distinguished colleagues in the college is the current chairholder. Um, uh, Sherwood Hall strongly believed that uh, an economic understanding is basic to effective forestry in a strong nation. And I've, I've always felt similarly and felt that forest economics should be one of the breadth requirements for a university education. Um, the university has never seen fit to come to me and say all students at Berkeley should have the course, but I, I strongly believe we would have a, a better nation uh, if that were part of the general education curriculum. Um, in keeping with the sentiment that uh, a background in forest economics and an appreciation of the principles of economics in forestry um, is important to sound management, we have this annual lecture as uh, a testament to uh, Hall's foresight. Um, so we, we appreciate the generosity that allowed us to have this forum. Uh, we hold this annual event uh, in part, I think its value is to say forest economics and management is really one of the hallmarks of our now century-old tradition of forestry here, and this is sort of the public face of that, that sort of core strength of our program. Uh, we've got Susan Call here uh, with nephews Kenneth and David, uh, David spouse Terry Hall. Uh, David and Dodie Hall couldn't be with us this evening, but I, I understand they are, are enjoying themselves immensely. Uh, in Reno at the moment. And so just a couple quick announcements here before I uh, invite Dr. Loxon and Craig to the forum. Uh, following today's uh, lecture, we're going to have a reception in the Ginkgo Courtyard. You can just exit through the doors here at the rear of the auditorium, follow the path up to the right. Um, and after the reception, we'll have a, a private dinner party for the California Alumni Foresters and their guests. And uh, those of you that are attending uh, the dinner, we'd like you to check in with the staff as you proceed from the reception area to the garden room. Uh, we'll have a question and answer period today uh, following Professor or Dr. Loxon and Craig's presentation. Uh, we'll have a couple runners running around with microphones. We ask that you wait for the microphone before you ask your question because in fact, um, no matter how 
well you project your voice, it will not be picked up on the film without the microphone. Uh, and we actually have many times as many people as are in this room view these videos of the, the lectures online. So wait for the mic and then ask Susanna a very hard question um, and speak, speak you know, slowly into the microphone. Um, take the opportunity to uh, take your cell phones and, and silence them. Technology is good, quiet technology is even better. Um, all right. So, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome uh, Dr. Loxon and Craig to the podium. She's worked for the province of British Columbia since 2007. Uh, after holding a variety of positions in the Ministry of Forest, Lands, and Natural Resource Operations, uh, Loxon and Craig has become the current head of the Climate Action Secretariat in the Ministry of the Environment. Uh, as you will be able to tell from the lilt in her voice, uh, Susanna is originally from Finland, just in case you might have thought she was from the Upper Peninsula, she's actually from Finland. Uh, brings, the accent actually brings back memories of being a student at Michigan State with a lot of friends from the Upper Peninsula. Um, she received her master's degree in forest economics uh, from the University of Helsinki, and she received her PhD in wildland resource science here in the College of Natural Resources. And I am very proud uh, to tell you she was one of my PhD students and uh, intellectually was always pushing me uh, to the limit of my comprehension. Uh, she's a lot smarter than I am. Please join me in welcoming Susanna. Keith actually reminded me that I actually did also, during when I was student here, receive a SJ Hall, uh, what was that Keith called? Some kind of a graduate fellowship. graduate fellowship, thank you. And so I had also the SJ Hall chair as my supervisor and the other SJ Hall as my committee member. So, so I truly owe a whole lot for um, SJ Hall for all kinds of things in my academic background and education. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here today. Um, Berkeley holds a very special place in my heart, as well as my husband's heart, and we often you know, reminisce about the fact that we came here, about we moved he from Florida and me from uh, Finland here about a week before the class he started, and we are wandering across the campus and we are talking about that. You know, these are probably gonna be the happiest years of our lives. Well, that was before we realized how darn hard you had to work at Berkeley. But in retrospect, it's all good, and you know, it has served, the education has served us very, very well. So, as Keith said, um, I have spent almost my whole entire career in forestry in, in various aspects of that, even ending up as the acting deputy chief forester of British Columbia at one point. However, for the past year, as he mentioned, I have been uh, leading British Columbia's climate file. So I kind of wanted for this talk to bring those two topics together because um, forests play a significant role in terms of adaptation um, and it also offers a significant mitigation potential in terms of uh, climate change and the emissions. So how I was going to approach is I was going to a little bit um, tell you how much the climate has already changed in British Columbia. This is not something that we expect to see in 50 years or 100 years. These changes are already happening uh, at this point. And those changes have caused significant impacts, for example, on our forest ecosystem in British Columbia. And this being the lecture of in, in industrial forestry, I also wanted to then show you specifically what it looks like in terms of the timber supply in British Columbia. And after we have gone through that somewhat depressing part of my talk, I wanted to then illustrate those ways how we are trying to ensure that our forests are better adapted uh, going forward and also the various ways we are trying to, in the most productive way, to use those resources we have and increase the value of those forest products that we are producing. 
So in terms of temperatures, um, here you can see um, how, the, how the climate has essentially changed in the past 100 years um, in British Columbia. So as you can see, um, we have already experienced um, increased temperatures. Um, the north um, has warmed faster, and there is also expect the northern area, northern part of BC, is also expected to uh, warm much faster than global averages going forward. Um, and the interior has, as you see, experienced higher rates of uh, temperature increases than, than the, the coast region. In terms of precipitation, the story is a little bit contrary. So also increases in terms of precipitation across the whole province. Um, so no, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't have also drought periods, we did this summer, but the overall precipitation has increased. Also the events of high precipitation have significantly increased. And um, in this case, we expect that it is the coast area that is going to experience much higher increase in, increases in precipitation than global averages. And it's also in terms of if, you, if we look at, for example, these 25-year return period one day events, uh, it is expected that those are going to start to happen about twice as often as they happen right now. Um, in terms of glaciers, um, also significant amount of retreat in terms of um, the glaciers, um, and this is expected to continue. So you see there at the end that, um, as a matter of fact, by 2100, it is expected that the glacier ice in Western Canada has shrunk uh, by 70% relative to 2005. So you can only imagine what kind of impacts this will have in all ecosystems, but for example, specifically on aquatic ecosystems uh, across. Then moving towards the, the forest ecosystems, um, how, we, how we in British Columbia uh, manage the land base, we use a method called uh, uh, biogeoclimatic uh, ecosystem classification. We all know it just as BEC. And it's a system where the bio, of course, uh, refers to the biology of the site, the vegetation. The geo looks at the soil and um, geology component. And the climatic looks at the overall, overarching climatic aspects of that specific site. We have 14 big zones in British Columbia. They have site, you know, uh, subsect sub species related to that, but you know, so zones all the way from Arctic tundra to very uh, coastal, coastal hemfer uh, zones. And um, Dr. Tong Li Wang, who works at the uh, University of British Columbia and works closely with the, the ministry researchers, the government researchers, um, has been doing a lot of work understanding how these climate envelopes change over time. His work already indicates that there have been significant changes in these envelopes over the past 20 years. He uses a statistical model called random forest to generate these, um, looking at those climate attributes and kind of running the model over and over and over, trying to find the best fit to those uh, back zone descriptions and allowing them to understand how these climate niches would uh, potentially move over time when the climate changes. So as I said, the climate has, those envelopes have already changed, but as you can see, we, we expect that there are gonna be significant further changes as the climate change uh, progresses over time. So what does that all meant? Uh, uh, the forest in British Columbia. I often just want to give people an idea um, about how much forest we actually have in British Columbia. And, and these numbers don't look so impressive in California, but when you talk, for example, to Europeans, it blows their mind, right? 
Um, so our total area is 95 million hectares. Forested land base, 55 million hectares. All that forested area, of course, is not available for timber harvesting, a lot of protected areas, um, set asides, and so on. But that 22 million hectares, if I did my math correctly, is over 54 million acres uh, that is available for timber harvest in British Columbia. Um, in terms of the area that gets annually harvested, it's about 200,000 uh, 200, hectares, which is about then uh, about half a million acres. Um, and so that is essentially the forest land base. Um, all our forestry happens in British Columbia. So what has been happening then on that land base? Well, the most significant change and the most visible change you can see there is the mountain pine beetle outbreak. This photograph, and the colors don't show really well there, but um, you can see that there are some green live trees but all that gray is just dead pine. And this picture was taken in interior uh, British Columbia, close to Silcotine. Um, if you know where, for example, Williams Lake is in that area. And so the devastation has been quite, quite extraordinary. And um, the mountain pine beetle is an endemic pest. We have always had uh, beetles in British Columbia. Um, the natural range of the uh, beetle goes from all the way from Mexico to northern BC. Uh, it's a very aggressive pest, um, likes large diameter all the trees. In British Columbia, lodgepole pine is uh, the main host. And typically, the epidemics are controlled by cold winters. Um, so you need winters where the temperatures drop uh, to minus 35, minus 40 uh, degrees. Um, and those cold spells, cold winters, then kill sufficient number of those bugs um, that we don't get epidemics. And as I said, we have always had these um, in our, when we look back all those forestry records in British Columbia, the oldest ones uh, that it has been recorded is from 1913. Although only when we started to really do aerial surveys in 1960s do we consider that we have reliable records. Um, there was, for example, in the beginning of the 1980s, um, about in the same area, a, another outbreak. But then we got a really cold winter in 1985, which stopped that epidemic. However, when this current epidemic started in 1999, there were no cold winters, and the population just absolutely exploded. And the following animation shows how the beetle infestation started in 99 and how it has spread across, across British Columbia. Now keep your fingers crossed, it worked earlier today, so we'll hope that it's gonna run now. So you can see where the epicenter was, and um, in terms of the coloration, um, now the hardest hit areas are turning gray, that is really hard to see. Um, but you can see that um, it spreads, and the color refers to the cumulative percentage of uh, pine volume killed. Um, this is now then the projection, but you can see that essentially the infestation is gonna run its course. It's essentially over in the epicenter where we started, um, but um, it's still gonna reach out to the uh, northernmost and southernmost parts of British Columbia. For the foresters, I wanted to also illustrate that map, that animation in a slightly different way. We manage our um, timber harvesting land base in terms of timber supply areas and tree farm licenses. This shows you how in various timber supply areas, how those areas were hit at the different times. The intensity and the, the um, volume killed uh, varies. Sometimes it was, of course, related to the pine volume, how much pine you had in any given timber supply area. But there was a significant um, difference uh, between those. If we now compare this one, uh, what we know right now, we know that, um, as a matter of fact, uh, we expect that the impact is not gonna be quite as high as we 
for example, estimated eight years ago. But it also was so aggressive, the infestation, and it kind of peaked much earlier and higher than we expected and then kind of dropped off. So if you then relate those kind of uh, figures and animation to just plain statistics, this is what it looks like. Um, so since 1999, an estimated 18.8 .8 million hectares have been affected. Um, about that is 10.2 million hectares uh, uh, of that timber harvesting land base. Um, that 10.2 should be about 25 million acres. And so where we are right now is that 53% of our merchantable pine is dead. Um, and as I said, the infestation has already peaked. Uh, the peak was at 2004. But in the northern and southern part, it continues. And in the highest hit or you know, early areas, we just had now significant volumes at dead pine. And so overall, about 730 million cubic meters of wood is now dead. Uh, sitting there in the forest. Some of that we have been able to harvest, uh, but majority of that will be in areas that commercial harvesting will never go. So what does that then mean for our timber supply? Here's another photo that shows an earlier, when the beetle um, attacks, there's a first what we call green attack. The, uh, the tree still stays green. You don't you can tell from the appearance of the tree they attack. Then it moves on to red attack where the, the tree is essentially dying it, uh, and the needles turn uh, red and then it moves to that gray attack where they, the tree is completely dead. And so the, here you see areas of that uh, red attack. So in terms of uh, timber supply then, uh, we expect significant uh, reductions um, on the long run. Uh, the, the annual allowable cut, allowable annual cut that is represented in these figures is based on the chief forester's determination. So, so the land base is uh, divided to these timber supply areas and tree farm licenses. Every single unit needs to have the allowable annual cut, essentially the harvesting potential, determined at least once in 10 years. And based on those determinations that are based on a lot of technical information, anything from you know, growth and yield um, to uh, the other timber production, infestation, uh, all kinds of productivity aspects. Um, Chief Forester receives public input to that, and it all, Chief Forester is also uh, governed by the direction he, he or she gets from the government in terms of the socioeconomic objectives. So based on that information, Chief Forester determines the allowable annual cut. Um, and this is what the future in British Columbia looks like. So our current AAC is about 75 uh, million he, uh, cubic meters. Um, at the highest, when we were trying to increase these uh, AACs to be able to salvage as much timber as possible, it reached about 85 million. But you can see there the pre uplift, essentially the pre beetle uh, allowable annual cuts were about 70 million. So you can say that the kind of like the long term, you know, productivity of the land leads you to have about 70 million cubic meters per year uh, available for harvest. You can see that in the midterm period when essentially the, all the dead wood uh, that is there that cannot be commercially utilized anymore is gone. And before the regeneration um, provides a new trees that are available for harvest, we expect to have that decades long uh, time period when the allowable annual cut is going to be about 20% lower than the pre-beetle harvest was. Um, this, of course, is not distributed evenly across the British Columbia. And I wanted to just uh, illustrate what has happened in some of the hardest hit uh, areas of the province. 
So for example, if you look at Williams Lake TSA um, close by where those photographs came, um, if we go back and look uh, what the allowable annual cut was in early 1990s, it was about 4 million cubic meters a year. In order to then, when the infestation started to go through, in order to try to salvage as much of that timber as possible, the allowable annual cut was increased to uh, close to 6 million. Um, Chief Forrester specifically targeted that. You were only, um, it was targeted to stands that were more than 70% pine and um, in order to try to salvage as much possible. Right now, earlier this year, it was determined again. Currently, the allowable annual cut is 3 million, and in the long term, we expect it to decrease to uh, less than 2 million. So, this harvest potential essentially uh, is the economic base for a lot of uh, rural communities in British Columbia. So, you can understand what kind of huge impact it has had in economies of those communities. Um, we have had already a number of uh, sawmill closures uh, in the interior, and there is potential that there are more to come. And, and that is one of those difficult issues for government to currently deal with. Um, Premier last week announced um, a program called Rural Dividend that will provide up to 75 million over three years for these small communities uh, in assistance for them to try to diversify um, the economies um, so that you know, the livelihood for those people would uh, continue in those rural areas. So that's pretty depressing, right? It's not a nice story. So what are we trying to do so that um, A, we can either try to utilize as much of that as we can, or that we would adapt going forward um, to have more resilient forests. So one of the areas where um, there is a lot of work done um, by the, the government researchers, um, as well as um, colleagues at, um, at our universities in British Columbia. Um, you can see uh, Professor Sally Eitken from UBC there. She is one of the lead um, researchers probably in the world in the area of uh, forest genetics. Um, and she has worked with us in many of these projects that I'm gonna talk a little bit about. Uh, we have many large-scale projects currently going on that are supported by uh, Genome Canada and Genome BC, um, trying to find those ways to adapt uh, the forest going forward. So one of the areas where there is a significant amount of work going on right now is the proposed climate-based seed transfer. The British Columbia's um, seed transfer is currently based on a geographic location. So it's restricted where the seed is collected and, and uh, where it's uh, planted. And this is, of course, um, our way to use the, the natural selection that has created the suitable seed for those um, specific conditions. However, currently the climate is changing faster than uh, the trees are able to adapt. So if we continue the current uh, system of our seed transfer, we risk that we have maladaptation, forest health issues, and so on going forward. So a lot of work is being done, uh, led by Dr. Greg O'Neill at the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations, um, looking at moving to climate-based uh, seed transfer. So for example, um, you can see uh, there on the, um, on the map, the, the big zone for that is the, uh, the boreal, uh, area for um, white and black spruce. Um, that's where the current planning 
planting area is. That's about the natural habitat of that. But moving forward, we also understand that the climate is going to change and understanding how those climate envelopes uh, help us to understand whether we could select also then more suitable seed uh, for those areas. It's the area of research he's working on and uh, looking at those opportunities. Um, kind of underneath that uh, framework um, is also assisted migration. So we have had um, a lot of research done trying to understand also, is there an opportunity for assisted migration? So in collaboration with US Forest Service uh, between 2009 and um, 2012, um, 48 sites were um, reforested uh, using seeds for 15 uh, tree species that, um, that naturally are in British Columbia and the surrounding um, uh, US states. And so we have now these um, assisted migration adaptation trials all the way from Northern uh, California, all the way to Southern Yukon. And those sites are now constantly monitored and logged how those uh, trees that were planted on those areas are reacting to these varying climate conditions that they are now uh, in, you know, encountering in those areas. And we hope that this will um, uh, kind of further our understanding what those opportunities then to plant uh, seeds uh, from different areas um, and help kind of the adaptation moving forward. And um, we are already moving this research to policy. And so what you see here is uh, the expanding range of Western large. Uh, Chief Forrester provides guidelines for uh, seed standards and, and seed use. Um, and um, Chief has already now expanded the range for Western Lodge, essentially adding additional areas where Western Lodge now can be planted uh, because we assume that in the 60 to 80 years that is the right climate uh, for those trees. Um, taking all this great work to policy, this is one example. We are also working on adapt in terms of um, adapting our stocking standards moving forward, providing guidance to licensees uh, who operate on the land base in terms of uh, what they need to consider uh, when they are making their reforestation decisions. Um, the memo on the uh, bottom, for example, is the guidance that um, directs now all the licensees operating there that when they are preparing their forest stewardship plans, they need to consider climate change as a part of the long-term health uh, uh, test for those sites. We also then, when appropriate, uh, provide these updated guidelines. You see, therefore, well, Kamloops, Thompson, Okanagan, an updated guideline that helps in terms of uh, when we have now this ecologically based understanding of uh, climate change and those recommendations, we provide um, additional guidance and updated guidance um, to, to manage those reforestation activities in the province. And then if you are a practicing forester, now you have much more complex world perhaps to manage than you did before. And so how do you manage within that uncertainty? So we are also working with um, various parties, the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium is one of them, to develop tools that help then to take that uh, updated guidance um, and um, use that effectively and understand uh, through these, for example, um, what are the options for tree, tree species selection. Um, timber supply um, 
analysis. We do a lot of research also to look at growth and yield, disturbances, all the variables that drive um, the information that is provided for chief forest for timber supply reviews. Um, updating all that information to reflect the changing climate and our uh, constantly increasing understanding uh, what the, how those forest ecosystem, how those forest stands are going to grow, how they are going to adapt, and um, how, what kind of productivity, productivity can we expect from those over time. Um, wildfire risk mitigation research. The, the beetle, of course, um, has increased the fire hazard significantly in our forest. Not only do we have um, dead trees there, and over time there's much more debris, of course, falling from the trees to the crown, but also the increasing salvaging efforts have left a lot of um, also uh, debris on the land base. So, so it's been a significant increase in the fire risk um, in those areas. And so there is active uh, research going on to understanding how can we better mitigate those risks and uh, treat and so on going forward. And, and needless to say that California is one of the places where we are looking to, into and uh, using what we can and collaborating where we can uh, to further our own understanding in this area. Then I wanted to kind of shift gears a little bit. And so that's a whole lot about the adaptation that we are working on. But, but there are different climate angles. Uh, if anybody is, for example, familiar with the research done by Werner Kurtz, who works for Canadian Forest Service, you have seen his work and that shows that, um, that forests provide significant also mitigation opportunities in, in terms of um, climate change. And um, one of those areas is, of course, the long-lived harvested wood products. Um, reforestation, utilization are significant components, but so is um, using more wood. And um, in 2009, um, British Columbia moved forward with Wood First Initiative. Um, and climate aspect was one of those aspects, but the other aspect of course was also to grow the markets for wood products. And Wood First have um, five strategic objectives um, you can see here. And it is about um, using more wood and growing that culture that we get accustomed to use wood, that wood, when it's appropriate material, is our first choice. Um, and um, we are also looking at this as an opportunity to also then provide value added uh, products and uh, building systems and so on. Wood First Act um, was, uh, came into force in 2009, and it specifically promotes greater use of wood in publicly uh, funded buildings. Uh, British Columbia uh, builds quite a number of schools and hospitals and other public buildings um, throughout, um, and, um, and invests money into these public buildings. So when now appropriate, we, we try to use wood as a first uh, choice of material um, and try to that way also kind of provide that leadership and examples um, so that we can demonstrate how wood works as a, as a material. So considering that province invests about $3 billion um, um, annually on, on an average year to infrastructure, this is a significant component. Um, this example here is, for example, a brand new elementary school in Richmond, British Columbia. I've come to think that there's probably Richmond everywhere. In every single state and province there is, there seems to be Richmond. So this is Richmond, British Columbia. And, and you can see that um, it's also architecturally quite striking um, um, and extensive use of wood in, in very creative ways there. So what else have we done? So as a part of the Wood First initiative, um, we also uh, looked into our building code. At the time, our building code allowed only four-story wooden structures. 
Um, we did a lot of extensive research, um, structural research, fire research, and so on. And the building code in 2009 was changed to allow six-story uh, wooden buildings. Um, Ontario and Quebec has since followed. Uh, British Columbia was the first province to constitute this kind of building code change. Other provinces have followed, and um, these kind of um, change is also going to be reflected in the national building code in Canada. So, example what you can then do uh, that the building code allows. Currently, uh, North America's tallest comp contemporary wood building is in Prince George. Uh, it is the Wood Innovation and Design Center. Uh, and I say contemporary, sometimes people ask me about and that is, of course, because in the early, you know, 1900, for example, wood was the material we used to build. So, for example, in Vancouver, we do have taller buildings and this. They wouldn't, of course, work with the current code the way that they are built, but there are such things do exist still. But um, so this is a example where um, it's a six-story building, but it also has a mezzanine and a penthouse. So all together, I have to look for how much is in feet. 97 feet tall, uh, this building. But then maybe that's not your limit, right? So, for example, the, currently the, the tallest uh, wooden building is in Melbourne, Australia. It's a 10-story building. There is one being built currently in uh, Norway near Oslo that is going to be 14 stories. But we like, we like pushing and, and seeing what we can do. So, in 2013, um, Wood Council Canada and Natural Resources Canada jointly uh, announced a tall wood building demonstration project. Um, and it was for requests for uh, expressions of interest. So, um, University of British Columbia uh, was one of the, uh, the proponents here. Earlier this year, they announced um, a request for proposals for themselves for a 18-story, 16 to 18-story building in, uh, on their campus. And yesterday came the announcement. So we are going to build world's tallest wood building at the UBC campus in British Columbia. It's going to be 18 stories. Um, it's going to be mixed use. It's going to be mainly a student residence, but it will have mixed uses. And now I have to go check the feet again. I know it's 53 meters tall, but it's 174 feet tall. Uh, um, so this $51.5 million project is going to create this really tall wood building. Um, UBC is aiming to get to at least lead gold uh, in terms of the, the performance standards. And um, it's expected to be finished in September 2017. It has been a huge collaborative effort between UBC, FB Innovations, uh, who has done the research, the federal government, who has provided some of the funding, provincial government, Ministry of Forest uh, Lands and Natural Resource Operations, that provided some of the funding um, to actually realize that. And, and we are very, very excited about this. And we see that um, this is one of the ways how we can um, advance the use of wood, because it is the, it is the kind of commercial niche that could be also filled as well as the, the residential, the taller residential buildings. Um, but to realize and to be able to build that kind of uh, buildings, you have to do a whole lot of work um, and research in terms of the building systems. Um, you also have to do a lot of research that allows those kind of products to be created that have the structural integrity and strength that you need to build those kind of buildings. And so FB Innovations have been the key partner and key driver with industry and uh, federal government and provincial governments doing that research and thereby allowing these opportunities to uh, come, come to uh, reality. Um, 
We also, if you think about the challenge we have with the pedal board, we are also working really hard trying to figure out what you can do with this pedal damaged wood. Because it is not, after a few years, it checks, it's, it doesn't create perfect lumber anymore. So FP Innovations is doing a lot of research understanding what kind of engineered wood products, appearance products you can create out of that. So for example, this picture here on the right, um, they look exactly like tiles when you see them in real life, except that they are made of wood. So they are creating some quite amazing uh, new products uh, that allow us to fully utilize uh, the fiber we have, which also through the fuller utilization provides a climate benefit. If you think then that um, what uh, British Columbians um, emissions profile looks like, about one third of our emissions come from transportation. And um, there's a role for, for example, electric vehicles following kind of what California is doing, you know, um, the attempts to, you know, move towards clean vehicles, to have zero emission vehicle mandates and so on. We follow and work with California through Pacific Coast Collaborative on those fronts. But there is the whole commercial sector and commercial transportation that is perhaps harder to get into. So FP Innovation was up to the challenge and they have done some research looking at that if all the logging trucks, this is not all the trucks in British Columbia that for example then haul lumber, these are just, just the logging trucks. So if the logging trucks hauling logs in British Columbia were actually moved, moved from uh, diesel to natural gas, you can see the estimation what those kind of um, emissions reductions could be realized from that. But it's not just benefit from climate perspective. Um, from the company's perspective, as you can see, there are also significant cost savings that could be achieved through uh, changing the fuel and doing that kind of fuel switching. So this is an active area of research. Uh, that we hope that uh, continues and will find these kind of opportunities and can also uh, move these to reality. And then at the end, I wanted to mention also a couple other things. Um, uh, Keith mentioned that British Columbia has a carbon neutral carbon tax. So it's a slightly different way of uh, pricing carbon, putting explicit price on carbon than California has. California is a part of cap and trade system and uh, for example uh, is in trading system with Quebec. We have a carbon tax that uh, we use to price our carbon and that way kind of influence uh, and move people to make choices that produce less emissions. But as a part of that leadership position, we um, also created what we call carbon neutral government. So all government operations in British Columbia are carbon neutral. So we reduce the emissions as much as we can, but what we cannot reduce, we will offset. So even though British Columbia is not part of any international trading system in terms of uh, carbon emissions. We have quite uh, robust and uh, lively uh, carbon offset market in British Columbia where government purchases these offsets in order to uh, pr you know, achieve the carbon neutrality. Um, and forestry projects play a significant role in government's achievement of those. Those are often the, the most cost effective uh, offsets we can find and um, we have significant portfolio of those. Currently a lot of those are conservation driven offsets, but we are actively currently also working at looking at other kind of uh, forestry based op offsets because companies have significant interest on in those. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on in British Columbia. We are trying to be proactive and lead. Uh, I have tried to choose a couple of examples of the work we are doing right now. Uh, it by no means captures it all, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and uh, if there are anything specific, I can always try to then further direct you to the experts back at home. Anyways, thank you. It has been a pleasure to be here.
In the uh, photographs of the um, mountain pine beetle damage, uh, there were some trees, uh, small areas, where the trees were not killed by the mountain pine beetle. Um, are, do those trees have a, a natural resistance, or uh, is that just by fluke that they were not attacked? There is probably a little bit of both of that, and, and sometimes in those photos what you see is, um, is hard to tell, but sometimes it's spruce, and that's why it wasn't killed. But there is such, such thing as I often call lucky pine. And um, in, some, in some cases we can tell that the infestation was so severe that they kind of just flew over for whatever weird reason. And so sometimes there are tracks that went infested, um, that it almost that the population of bugs flew over. But there are certain trees that seem to have escaped uh, the beetle. And that is also part of the, the research that is being done. We are trying to identify that what makes some of the trees, what are those traits that make them more perceptible um, or less perceptible uh, to the box. So we don't have full understanding that yet, but we are certainly interested in understanding those aspects. So Susanna, the last time I was in British Columbia, I was uh, on a field tour of the very first resolution of any of the First Nations claims. Yeah. Has the distribution of this pine die-off or the plans for utilization of it in any way complicated that whole process of dealing with provincial authority versus First Nations claims on forest management? Um, we are increasingly moving towards where the, the First Nations are full partners in forestry with us. And so we have, for example, um, forest revenue uh, sharing. So we share the forest revenue with First Nations uh, from those areas that they have that are part of their traditional territory. Um, and so from that perspective, the, the First Nations are equally uh, concerned and willing to try to mitigate what they can. From their perspective, it's also, um, also the loss of cultural values um, and the, sometimes the sacred areas, all that is significant. Uh, and, and, um, and there is not a lot that can be done when the ecosystem is gone. It's gone and it will take time to recover. In terms of um, the First Nations, so there is only one area that where First Nations hold a title to the area. It's in Silcotine, uh, fairly close to the Williams Lake area. Um, and that is a fairly recent Supreme, uh, Supreme Court of Canada's decision, about a year old now, that decision, a little over a year old. And, um, and there's still a lot of work going on, fully understanding what does it mean uh, going forward in terms of Forest Act and the different powers in Forest Act. Overall, though, the province is trying to find a path forward, as I said, as full partners. So we have a number of First Nations who are in treaty process right now, um, and also a number of uh, First Nations who have uh, uh, sign these various kind of agreements, revenue sharing agreements, and, and so on. Um, and um, some of them are not even interested in seeking title as it is right now, but it is a very complex landscape, and our forestry companies are very accustomed to working in that context. Um, I can imagine that a company who has never had to operate uh, in that kind of a uh, system where you you have a duty to consult with the First Nations um, might find it extremely you know complex because a lot of those uh, consultations, for example, are significantly based on on the trust and existing relationship between the First Nation and the, and the players on the land base and the province. So. It is something that we continue to work to improve those relationships. Um, um, oh, there you go. 
Um, building buildings with that timber, do you see energy efficiency improvements of any sort, if any? Energy efficiency in terms of the, um, the industry, um, they have made quite a bit of um, investments in terms of their own facilities and everything. And, um, and they continue to make those. Um, and in some cases, if there is, for example, a offset opportunity in terms of fuel switching, for example, them moving from natural gas to uh, renewable energy using, for example, their own waste materials uh, to generate the energy, there's an opportunity there. In terms of uh, emissions, um, the energy efficiency of buildings is something that we are hugely interested in uh, going forward. And that is also part of the research that is done by FB Innovations and others uh, to find those opportunities there. Um, the interesting thing about British Columbia is that um, 96% of our electricity is renewable. That includes our large hydro. So, you know, if you are already using a lot of electricity and you are already using, for example, then a lot of your wood face in these facilities, from the climate perspective, you are already incredibly clean and there is only limited opportunities to, from emissions perspective, to improve the operations. And also, I have a follow-up question. Um, Concerning the infested wood, what other incentive do you have to give that to the consumers besides it looking good? If, if any. So what other incentives do we have? Can you repeat the, did you get that, Catherine? Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, how are you going to get the consumer to buy the, um, the infected wood besides it looking good? Uh, so in terms of the products that we then produce, um, when the, the tree is dead, it's dead. There is nothing wrong with the wood except that um, it, for example, when it dies, it dries and it creates these very deep checks. So the lumber recovery out of those logs is much poorer when, as compared to when you are sawmilling uh, live logs, right? But, but there is nothing in those logs that, for example, the lumber that is produced out of those, that it would have any health impacts or anything like that. Other, otherwise, it's absolutely um, similar, you know, lumber product that it would otherwise be. With the bug, uh, it often um, brings a fungus that creates this blue tint to the wood. And so it's not such a big problem. For example, uh, we have a large uh, export market to China where they use it for framing. It it's, doesn't matter for that purpose so much. But we, but we have also looked into producing appearance uh, products out of the infested um, blue tinted uh, uh, wood and we call it denim pine and so if any one of you wants to have denim pine you can come to British Columbia and purchase some. We'll ship it to California for you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if there are any biological or chemical control measures that are currently being explored to control the expansion of the mountain pine beetle. There is no chemical treatment available at all. Harvesting is essentially the, the early detection, of course, is kind of key. You try to um, detect early um, and so on. But in terms of treatment, um, harvesting is the, the only really effective method. Um, in a normal year, um, about 70% of the treatment is, happens as harvesting. But in this case, um, the, you know, the infestation was so massive, it moved so fast that there was, in the early years of the invest infestation, they did try harvesting, they tried cutting all kinds of breaks. It did not help, it, it wasn't controllable. So, so there isn't a very effective ways, for example, in terms of chemical treatment to uh, manage the population. 
Uh, still on our friend, the, the beetle. We're, we're losing a lot of pine trees in the middle range of the Sierras. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, is there a natural predator that can keep the, the beetle in check, or is that a, 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 a pure wishful thinking? No, it's the cold wind that is the predator. And so we need those uh, cold winters because um, when, um, when they lay the eggs, they are underneath their, uh, the bark and the cold winter penetrates far enough to kill majority of those and that keeps the population in check. Well, let's give Susanna a round of applause and thank her for your time.